Welcome, Dr. Fatmir. So all, all the great professors are here today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It is now five. It is now five thirty. Can we start with the permission? Yes, of yes. Our, start now. And, yeah, yeah. Speakers. Yes. Yeah. Good number of participants are already here. Okay. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Respecter, Mufti Dr. Muhammad Wasi. Fasif Bhatt, Editor, Hamdard Islamicus Pakistan, Professor Dr. Dawood Abdul Malik, Yahya Al Hidabi, Director, International Institute for Muslim Unity, IIUM, Associate Professor Dr. Amna Bahari, Associate Professor at the Department of Usuluddin and Compared Religion, IIUM. Head of the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion, professors, colleagues, honored guests, students, participants from overseas, and ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen, Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> I am pleased to welcome you all this evening to the international webinar on research methodology from the Islamic perspective organized by the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion in collaboration with Hamdar Islamicus Pakistan and the International Institute for Muslim Unity, International Islamic University, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. The Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion is dedicated to teaching Usuluddin and Comparative Religion. Objectivity in teaching religions is one of the significant aspects of the department. The department is unique in the country and perhaps in the Muslim world, for it combines the knowledge of Usuluddin and comparative religion. The department educates its students to learn the art of addressing and solving issues of multi-ethnic and multi-religious society in order for people to live in peace and harmony. The department attempts to ensure its students grasp the knowledge, acquire competence in specialization in terms of knowledge and research, and contribute to new dimensions of contemporary Islamic thought. The students are educated to connect the underlying philosophies and values of knowledge along the line of maqasid sharia and maslaha. Its students can interact with people from a multi-religious society and present Islamically oriented knowledge, yet universally embracing. Its students extend the values and skills acquired as a scholar of knowledge into other areas of life, such as the analytical ability to judge things critically and avoid hearsay information. They can provide 
logical views from a religious standpoint that nurtures a probing mind and conduct open discussions that benefit all. The students present a mindset and an attitude that identify problems in socio-cultural and historical contexts, not merely as problems worked out in the mind that may be logical, but empirical and, and practical in real life situation. They can communicate ideas developed and formulated in a different era into the contemporary understanding of up-to-date concepts and language. They are able to relate Islamic intellectual legacy, tradition, and contemporary sciences as a symbiosis of knowledge that is at once Islamic and contemporary. Despite all these aspirations and achievements, we strongly feel that we still can improve ourselves and our students by dedicating ourselves to the process of integration, Islamization, and relevantization, which are the niche areas of the department and the kulia. As a complete and comprehensive way of life and civilization, inspired by the worldview of Islam and the revelation, Islam refers to knowledge and its need to advance human life. It offers ways and means for the sustainable development of humanity through the observance of the maqashid as sharia. The first Quranic revelation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the omniscient, and the creator and the sustainer commands us to iqra, which means to read or recite. This concept of iqra has been the first concept that Allah made obligatory. The word istiqra is derived from qara, which means investigation, examination, and exploration. Thus, one may conclude and advocate that the concept of iqra refers to reading or recitation and investigation or exploration. One may deduce that research that involves examining and investigating a phenomena is implicitly made imperative by the creator. In addition, the ayah of the Quran further mentions that the process of ikra should take place in the name of the Lord who created. Indeed, reading is a symbol for the advancement of knowledge and sciences. Advancement of knowledge and sciences will eventually lead to the sustainable development of humanity. Therefore, in other words, we can assert that the message of the Quran is unambiguous in that it requires its followers to develop or produce knowledge in light of the revealed guidance. Bro, bro, you have unmute bro, your voice. Unmute your voice, please. Amin, we cannot hear you. Oh. So you can you couldn't hear anything from the beginning? No, no, we just we you just stop. You continue now. We we, okay. we heard all of you. Okay, fine. Okay, therefore, in other words, we can assert that the message of the revelation is unambiguous in that it requires its followers to develop or produce knowledge in light of the revealed guidance. The term Bismi Rabbika conveys that intellectual activities 
related to knowledge should be pursued in the name of the Lord, which implies the frameworks and methodologies shall be in line with the objectives of the revelation. This is nothing but creating, developing, advancing, and producing knowledge for the benefit and sustainable development, peace, and harmony of mankind. Hence, as stipulated in the first revelation, the production of knowledge under the Quranic objectives is a challenging task we face today. There are several types of research, fundamental research, applied research, descriptive research, analytical research, empirical research, quantitative research, qualitative research, conceptual research, historical research, and hybrid research, and many more. All these types of research do not guide researchers from the Islamic perspective. They refer to technicalities that are different. Therefore, we need to know what should be the methodology of research from the Islamic perspective. Although there are discussions on this theme, we have yet to see a concrete and scientific research methodology from the Islamic perspective. For this purpose, the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion is organizing this international webinar in collaboration with Hamdar Islamicus and International Institute for Muslim Unity. Today's webinar will discuss the theme of research methodology from the Islamic perspective. We have three learned and experienced speakers who will deliberate on the topic and provide some significant guidelines and frameworks for researching from the Islamic perspective. Without taking much of your time, let me end my welcoming speech by thanking you all for your interest and participation in this international webinar. We have a learned speaker, Professor Dr. Mufti Muhammad Wasi, who is currently the editor, which is indexed in Scopus, the Hamdad Islamicus. To give you a brief background about our respected editor, he is an editor, a Scopus Index quarterly research journal launched by Shaheed Hakim Muhammad Saeed in 1978. Dr. Wasi is also an assistant professor of Hamdard University and visiting faculty of many higher educational institutions. Dr. Wasi has authored four books and he has published various articles in reputed national and international journals. Besides his academic role, Dr. Wasi has rich experience in Islamic banking and finance. He is serving many Islamic financial institutions, including banks, asset management companies, and private limited companies in the capacity of Sharia advisor. I most respectfully call upon respected Mufti Dr. Muhammad Wasi Fasi Bhatt, Editor Hamdar Islamicus, Pakistan, to share his thoughts on research methodology from the Islamic perspective. Fal Atafadal Mufti Dr. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah rahman rahim. Nahmuduhu wa nusalli ala rasuli al karim. Rabbishrahli sadri wa asli amri wa hul atadam milisani yafkahun kauli. I'm feeling honored uh, while being in the uh, in the gathering of a learned scholars, um, uh, honorable uh, faculty members, and uh, valuable uh, audience. So uh, um, my greetings and assalam to all of you. Uh, who are present in this webinar and who are listening to us uh, through live streaming and will listen to us 
uh, our recording le lecture. So the theme of my topic is uh, research methods and research ethics from the uh, in perspective of Sharia. While I entitled my uh, presentation as the research need and ethics principles from the Holy Quran, because uh, even though there are many sources um, of Sharia, like the Holy Quran, the Sunnah, the consensus of Sahaba and the scholars and sayings of the Sahaba and Ahlbet, while um, the Holy Quran is considered as the primary, most primary source of the Sharia. So, um, and, and the Muslims believe that the Holy Quran is the only divine, revealed, pure knowledge present in this world. Uh, so uh, this uh, webinar, this uh, talk will be a very much uh, um, thought provoking and, uh, and very much informative to all the um, uh, sectors and the, uh, all the humans. So um, uh, while I start my uh, research and my presentation, I um, I want to share that after reading these uh, uh, slides and after uh, listening to these slides, uh, everyone will be feeling that the Holy Quran uh, is so much related to the research that Muslims should be champions of the research if they truly believe and truly follow the Holy Quran and, uh, and the Sharia. So, uh, coming to my first slide, the Holy Quran encourages observation, deep learning, and investigation. Uh, and the Holy Quran warned me and you to build my research on pure uh, reasoning and by build my result uh, results on observation, practical observations, deep learning, and after a thorough investigation of the data. So Holy Quran says, uh, I start, uh, so they do not look at the camels, how they are created, and the sky, how is it is raised high. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally asking me that I should uh, uh, observe with open eyes the all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because these creations will give me um uh, inside so that i will uh, believing i will be believing on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more uh with my observation uh i will get uh more uh, research and i will get more research topics and these research will lead me towards the um in-depth belief on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secondly uh deep learning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the chapter 4, do they not then ponder upon the Quran. Had it been from the someone other than Allah, they would have found it in a great deal of discrepancy. What does it mean? It means that I should not just read. Although the reading of the Quran is also a reward, something which is which will be rewarded, uh, but I am supposed to ponder upon the Quran, to think in a deep manner, uh, so that every verse will give me a uh, ocean of knowledge so, third uh, investigation and proper and thorough investigation and checking of and validation of my data allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says oh you who you believe yes i am and you are uh, addressed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta says if a sinful person uh, uh, brings you a report verify correctness i repeat verify its correctness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally asking me that do not believe on any theory or any data or any forwarded post or any information just because it has been shared by someone. But you, it's your religious duty to verify its correctness. Uh, uh, for example, when a hadith is being uh, um, uh, sent to me on WhatsApp from anyone, anyone, but I should not forward it to someone without verifying its uh, references. Similarly, if any uh, piece of knowledge is being shared with me by anyone, I should not believe on it just because it is uh, written on the website, but I should verify its correctness, its validity, is it correct? Or is the uh, piece of information is being uh, derived from any original resource? 
or from any authentic uh, source or it is just a fake news so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says less you should you should harm people out of ignorance and then become uh, remorseful on what you did so uh, this is the consequences of uh, blaming on any uh, wrong information so uh, today's modern um, research methods also combine these three parameters like uh, experimental uh, observations, deep learning, and, um, and validation of data. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran mentioned these three parameters uh, long before. Uh, uh, moreover, Holy Quran stresses on research instead of more conjecture. Uh, what is the uh, dilemma um, and what is the problem? Uh, today, many errors are occur in the uh, information because of replacement of knowledge with the conjecture so any information or any um, uh, information should be based on the pure knowledge proven results not on the mere uh, perception holy quran says do not follow a thing about which you have no knowledge and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not have a perception without a pure justification or proper reasoning Surely the ear, the eye, the heart, each one of them shall be interrogated about. It is very much a um, uh, thing of uh, worry that I will be in, uh, 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 questioned about my beliefs also and my thoughts also that uh, why you perceive this, why you have a perception of this on about someone. Uh, and why uh, we, we gave you air and eyes and heart to think, to listen, but you were blind and you were following a blind information uh, and wrong information. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not follow anything, anything about which you have no proper knowledge. And secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they do not have knowledge about it. They follow nothing but conjecture. And the conjecture is of no avail in the matter of truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condemning, uh, is um, a, a very bad habit of the people of the arrogance, the uh, people of Jahiliyyah before the arrival of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then they follow only uh, perceptions. Uh, conjecture and this is not a good habit this is not a habit for a muslim to believe on the uh, just uh, um, without any proper and proven reasons and justification and the data just on the uh, mere perception i think this is not a uh, uh, habit this should not be a habit of researcher i think is nothing but i believe on the basis of the these proper results and the tests and the uh, research matters uh, this slide is very much interesting uh, i believe that uh, uh, every researcher and every academician should um, think um, about it then what is the real impact of my research beyond impact factor should i have what is the purpose everything has a purpose what is the purpose of my research am i doing my research to get a grant or to get a sponsor from the industry or to get promoted from assistant professor to associate from associate to professor or i'm on any monetary and worldly gain or my uh, research is to create an impact on the society uh, any uh, uh, this, uh, an interesting um, uh, project was launched in 2014 by UK uh, authorities, which entitled Research Excellence Framework, uh, under which UK higher education institutions submitted 6,975 impact case studies demonstrating the impact of their research on wider society. While uh, uh, analyzing their impact, impact was defined as an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment or quality, and most importantly, beyond academia. Just I scratch your bag, you are scratching my bag, just I'm publishing your article, you are publishing my article, this is, I'm citing your article, you are citing my mind. This is not the purpose of the research. Research should be a problem. So, uh, solving um, uh, phenomena 
our research should be have a real impact in the real society. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says uh, He sent down water from the heavens, so the canals canals uh, so the canals fl uh, flood uh, according to their capacity, and the flood carried bulging scum. Similarly, scums come up from what they melt in the fire to obtain ornaments or other subjects. Like uh, it is the uh, phenomena that. Uh, if we want a pure gold, then we have to burn it out in the uh, process in the lab. Then after that, we get pure on uh, gold. Uh, th uh, this is the phenomena that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to. Allah says, this is how Allah depicts the truth and the untruth. As for the scum, it goes to be thrown away. The impurity goes away. But while that which benefit people remain on the earth, this is the universal truth. And um, this is the uh, formula Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said on the earth that anything which will be beneficial for the humanity will sustain while uh, impure and the uh, um, uh, uh, useless things will go away. So if my research is useful for the humanity, then it will, uh, uh, it will be cited, it will be remain uh, um, remain on the earth on the surface of earth now in after a century even even we are citing and we are referring to the books of the uh, learned scholars of imam ghazali uh, uh, Lama imam bukhari uh, even though they have died centuries ago because they, their piece of work was beneficial and is beneficial for the humanity so i should not be having a ultimate purpose just to have a cumulative impact factor of uh, 100 and more but i should receive my uh, research work i should uh, carry my research work for the benefit of humanity uh interestingly holy quran cites references allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is beyond any accountability and allah ta'ala needs nothing to cite uh, but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us demonstration that a holy Quran cites references. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in this is written in the, uh, indeed, this is written in the earliest divine scripts, the script of Ibrahim and Musa. And in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, has he not been told of what was revealed in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim, who fulfilled his duties? And in both words, you can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran referred any knowledge um, uh, uh, which is mentioned in the previous verses that uh, uh, these knowledge these data is being mentioned in the earlier divine uh, revelations also so uh, if we are copying or if we are referring to any piece of information in our article in our book then we should cite we should refer the primary source we should mention that this information is being cited is being uh, extracted from this reference it is not an ethical an ethical practice that i am copying any knowledge but i am not, not referring the author uh, this is against the quran holy quran's uh, ethical um, uh, research uh, guidelines holy quran encourages original research from authentic uh, resource and I, I repeat original research not a compromise research and from authentic resources either it could be a primary source or it could be a secondary resource but the source should be authentic should be valid if i am citing if i am doing a research on uh, um, on the digestive system of the human then i should not referring to the this um uh, my research to uh getting the uh, uh, the information from a religious book or from a uh, political book i should be referring i should be uh, gathering information from the reliable sources of medical science similarly the case with the sharia if i am uh, uh, i am doing a research on the uh, uh, hadith of prophet then i should be referring to the primary resource uh, uh, and authentic resources which are say bukhari say muslim Dami Tirmizi, and sunan al -Zai, and more uh, authentic books not i should not be referring to the uh, books which are uh, which uh, contain some um, uh, fabricated hadith also uh, 
uh, without any uh, uh, if i'm quoting these books then i should be validating and I should be checking the authenticity of the hadith i'm referring to uh, as per the uh, uh, science of the hadith so this is the case that original research from authentic sources allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says travel in the land and see how was the faith of the sinner allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging me to and you to discover by myself not to believe that this is happening in the uh, canada and this is happening in the uk uh, uh, and perceiving that uh, people are in uh, in in this country are not um, honest people in the, the, that country are rich and uh, having a peace of mind so uh, this could be a, a general perception but if i'm uh, quoting something in in a research work that i it is preferred that i should meet even i should uh, visit that place and should have a personal experience of the, those people or even i should uh, meet the persons who have met that those group of people secondly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says surely we gave musa nine clear signs so ask the children of israel and ask the um, first al bani israel allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring then uh, we should uh, uh, uh refer uh, uh we should check the matter with the relevant person because the um, uh, people of um, uh, book are um, more close uh to their scriptures so if we are uh, i'm i am uh, doing the research on the earlier scriptures and books then i should uh, get in uh, i should interview the uh, scholars of those religion and uh, should check the books of those religions. So uh, that religion. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, is giving an insight in this verse that if I am mm, telling a thing about Musa al-Islam, then you should ask the Bani Israel about, um, uh, about it. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when he came to them, Prabhu said to him, I am afraid, oh Musa, you are under the spell of magic. So this was the thing I I know when it is mentioned it is being mentioned in the Holy Quran it is confirmed but uh, it is the indication from this verse that uh, we should uh, refer to the primary source we should met, uh, we should meet the relevant person for uh, authenticity of any information Holy Quran encourages validated data. Um, I repeat, validated data, not a mere information piece of information. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We recite to you a part of the story of Musa and Pharaoh with truth for a people who believe. Then um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I am quoting the uh, story of Musa and Pharaoh with truth. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always says those words. But Allah ta'ala mentioned this, uh, the word with truth for me that. If I am doing a research and I am quoting a person, I am quoting a story, I should quote it with a responsibility, with a sense of responsibility, with after validating, after checking the um, original source. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in other words, we narrate to you their story with truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this verse related to the Ashab uh, al-Kahf. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bilha. So, Haq represent that truth. That any matter, any uh, quotation, any uh, reference should be mentioned with truth. After a proper validation, after a proper checking, that I, if I'm mentioning uh, that uh, uh, scholar ABC has quoted, uh, has mentioned, and has has this opinion, that I should not. Uh, relying on the secondary data, on the um, uh, uh, compromised data, I should be checking the original book. That is this uh, the opinion of that person. I should read the whole literature. Then I should uh, mention the exact words or exact opinion, so that this opinion should be narrated with truth. Uh, we should not be. Uh, quoting uh, anything without proper checking. Um, last but not the least, the Holy Quran condemns scientific misconduct. 
it is the um, dilemma of this world that uh, we are facing some uh, errors, some unethical uh, scientific approach um, that some people uh, are compromising the uh, um, uh, research methods, research methodology, and producing a very um, dirty uh, uh, material, dirty uh, uh, work. So a statement developed by the US Office of Science and Technology policy defines misconduct as a fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism in proposing, performing, or reviewing research or importing research results. So uh, three things are there, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. If any thing any uh thing uh, any one of these thing uh, three things uh are present or present in any uh, research work it is uh, uh considered uh, as a, a scientific misconduct and it is a, a, a crime uh, and um, in a, a religious word it is a sin of the research work it should be a sinful act because uh, it not only um, um, violate the uh, laws of the research but also violate the Sharia guidelines also. So let's see. Uh, one of the uh, um, uh, this uh, three uh, one of these three sinful uh, research uh, activity is that uh, fabrication. Fabrication is defined by the U.S. authorities making up data results. So, uh, making you are making your own data. There is no data. If you are working, for example, you are working on the uh, textile industry, and uh, you are quoting that I have interviewed uh, a thousand uh, industrial uh, industrial uh, places, and um, in that country there are only 500 industry uh, working there. So how can you say that you are you have a sample of thousand industrial um, projects? It means that you are making your own data. It is the fake data. It is the um, and uh, uh, I'm I'm worried that if you are proposing, if someone is proposing a, a statement on the basis of this fabricated and this false data. And some uh, industry uh, industrial expert is making a policy on the basis of this conclusion and this uh, recommendation, and something goes uh, wrong. That researcher will be uh, in uh, accountable in the hereafter. That because of his false recommendation, uh, a person make uh, made his policy of business. So it should be a very religious duty that I am not. I should not. I should rely my uh, my statements, my research on the uh, original data, or not a false data. Uh, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "So woe to those who write the book with their hands and then say this is from Allah. This is the practice of the people of um, uh, arrogance, people of ignorance, and um, uh, like uh, the Jews and the Christians of that era." Uh, the era of the Prophet وسلم, before the advent of Islam, that they uh, wrote something uh, in the and they made amendments in their they were revealed books and uh, publicly say that said that this is from Allah. So they are manipulating the uh, original sources. So this practice is very much condemned by the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah says, says curse and the punishment to those who do, uh, who are habitual of these things. So uh, a researcher should not make up his own data, he should um, gather the original data from the original sources. Secondly, falsification. Falsification is manipulating research material equipment or process or changing or omitting data or results such that the Research is not accurately represented in the research record, and it means it means that you are uh, not uh, research oriented. You are uh, result oriented. Yet you made up mind before the research that I want to produce this. I want to uh, support support this theory, or I want to uh, 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 make this uh, hypothesis acceptable. But I I want uh, I I am of the opinion that uh, of this um, belief. So I have to justify. I have to 
support uh, my uh, supports my beliefs my thoughts my opinion with the help of data so the, your data is secondary and your uh, your personal beliefs your your um, uh, thoughts your uh, predefined uh, conclusion are secondary so you are making a research just to support your thoughts this is not the uh, right way the right approach that you should have a neutral mind and you should uh, work on the um, research uh, project with open mind that uh, either my theory may be rejected or may be accepted so uh, the data should not be uh, twisted or should not be manipulated in a way that it should bring your desired results allah subhanahu wa taala says do not confound truth with falsehood and do not hide the truth when you know it and if you know the uh, truth you should not hide it and you should not mix the truth with the falsehood wala talbisul haqq bil batil wa taktumul haqq wa antum ta'lamun the third thing is that the third uh, uh, unethical practice is plagiarism and everyone knows plagiarism is the appropriation of another person's ideas process results or words without giving appropriate credit and if you are quoting someone if you are uh, mentioning uh, if you are mentioning the knowledge piece of knowledge uh, after reading a book or um, uh, or any research article and you are uh, mentioning it that this is uh, your research work it is not an uh, ethical practice and it should not it should be condemned and it is um, uh, i think it can be uh, um, um, uh, it should it can be um, mentioned as uh, uh, stealing some information like if you are uh, stealing the uh, pearls or mobile or any valuable thing is a sin or is a very uh unethical uh, practice then like uh, stealing some ideas of some information from uh, some other work and without uh acknowledging acknowledging that person is also a sin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not think of those do not think of those uh, who are delighted with what they did and love to be praised for what they never did please emphasize on this uh, uh underlying sentence that love to be praised for what they never did uh and you ahmadu bima lam yaf'alu if i had not done this research by i am quoting this in my presentation in my uh, in my lectures in my research work without referring to the uh, the original uh, researcher it it means that i want to be praised for i what i have i had never did so allah subhanahu wa taala says do not think they are secure from the punishment for them there is a painful punishment so um, i should not be uh, getting uh, encouragement or in, uh, getting promotions for a uh, research which i have uh, i had not done i should uh, i should uh, uh, very honestly uh, refer that this research is being done by that person so um uh, expressing these that i have um, these were my uh, source of inspiration while doing uh, making these uh, references although i uh, made my uh, slides from many uh, uh, verses and very pranic um, thoughts but these were the primary uh, piece of uh, motivation for me to uh, make up these slides so uh, with this i end up my presentations and i thank you all for your pain, uh, patience and for uh, for your uh, listening and um, and jazakumullah khair for all of you but uh, i can conclude my presentation with the uh, with the, my thoughts that um, uh, muslim should be champion of the research if they uh, truly follow the holy quran and we are not only distinct uh, distinct from the holy quran by practice by we are also distinct from the holy quran by intellectual also because allah subhanahu wa taala as uh, clearly mentioned in these verses and indication from these verses allah subhanahu wa taala want me and you and all the believers to be have a uh, 
analytical approach to have a uh, research mind to have a, uh, in, uh, a rational thinking to have a uh, 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 to have a wisdom of every uh, anything which we are doing. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Allah ta'ala uh, uh, bless someone who uh, is very much beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wisdom. So wisdom is a blessing. We should be uh, working on, uh, on our um, un on universities and colleges and madaras, uh, for promoting the research. The right. research culture is very much lacking in our society. We should be research based. Like research is not the uh, 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 unique aspect or you should, it should not be a unique feature of the West. It should be the uh, a part and parcel of every Muslim society. With this, I conclude my presentation. Uh, these are my humble submissions. Again, I'm really thankful for all of you, your the organizers and all the listeners for um, having uh, patience while listening to my thoughts. Thank you all. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wasi, for your enlightened and thought-provoking presentation on the theme, which is research methodology from the Islamic perspective. And uh, I do not have sufficient time to uh, summarize and uh, present before the learner audience. I'm sure that the learner audience has been uh, receiving your presentation in a systematic manner. With this, I move on to the second presenter speaker, uh, who is none other than Professor uh, Dr. Daoud Al-Hidabi, who is currently the Director for International Institute for Muslim Unity to give you a brief background about Prof. Al Hidabi. Prof. Al Hidabi got his first degree in physics in 1977, Sana University, Amman. He studied his PGCE in teaching physics, MED, and PhD in education in the UK in 1980 to 1986. He worked at Sana University from 1987 to 2015. He was the founding president of the University of Science and Technology, MN, uh, during 1994 to 2007. He published more than 140 papers, supervised more than 150 master and PhD theses, and co-authored several textbooks. Currently, he is the editor in charge of three academic journals. Al-Hidabi is a member of the advisory boards and reviewer for several national and international journals in education. Prof. Al Hidabi became a professor of education at IIUM Malaysia in 2016. He also works as the director of the International Institute for Muslim Unity. He is also the chairman of the Islamic Agency for Quality Assurance and Accreditation of the Federation of Universities of the Islamic World, uh, which is hosted by the IIUM. He engaged in consultancy and training for national and international organizations such as ministries of education and higher education, World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, ISESCO, OIC, IIIT, and others. His areas of interest are curriculum and instruction, quality and governance, integration of knowledge, strategic planning, higher education, uh, leadership, and universities auditing and performance development. With this, my respectfully call upon Professor Daud al Hidabi to make his presentation. <laughs> Brought by Dr. Tamim for your invitation, and um, I, and also uh, I would like to welcome Prof. Abdulaziz Barwuth, uh, the the Dean of Stack, where Emo is part of it, and Alhamdulillah, we have organized together this webinar, and I have proposed this webinar to Prof. Tamim, and he willingly accepted the proposal. I'm very happy because this is one of my concern during uh, the whole career, because I'm teaching research methods for more than 30 years. Um, again, I would like to uh, thank uh, brother Dr. Muhammad Mukti for highlighting the significance and the importance of ethics in, uh, uh, in research based on Quran. 
um, I hope that we can learn also from uh, Associate Professor Amna Bahari later after my presentation, inshallah. So let me just start with um, one aspect that is what make us unique from other philosophies in terms of research methodologies are three things. First, our ultimate goals, because research should lead to achieve our ultimate goals. If we look at quantitative or qualitative, they do not believe in religion. They do away with re revelation. They focus on this life and the material life, not the spiritual life. So our ultimate goals, seeking Allah's pleasure, worshiping Allah, performing the role of Khalifa, constructing this life and the life to come, shouldering the responsibility of amana or trust, and fulfilling Allah's commandment in this life, which is the life for a test. So research has to reflect these goals in the long term. Life for others are limited to materialistic aims and personal desires. This is a very big difference. The second is the assumption that is what we take for granted as is stated in the Quran and the Sunnah. Because we believe that Quran and Sunnah is authentic and objective knowledge, which include our beliefs, ethics, worship, and also guidelines for our life. All these assumptions have to be taken in consideration when we conduct our research. Also, the third thing is motivation. What motivates us based on our beliefs, emotion, and action is to seek Allah's help, Allah's forgiveness. So the Muslim researcher should have intrinsic motivation and try to innovate and to be creative, to have impact on our life and humanity life. Those broad uniqueness principles for sure will influence the way we conduct research. Starting from the selecting the topic, we will have a different approach in how to select the topics of research how to adopt a particular research methodology or methodologies. Also the type of tools to gather data. In fact, the type of data we gather, the sampling process, the analysis of data and reporting our outcomes. These three unique principles would affect all these steps in conducting research. Brother and sisters, one of the assumptions is the role of man. If we talk about the nature of man, the nature of life and the nature of knowledge, and what are the implication of these three concepts, for instance, because we don't have time to discuss all the concepts, then these assumptions relevant to these three concepts, man, life, and one, reality and knowledge, would affect our research. So research in Islam begins with the basic principle stated in the ayah, all in salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya Say, O Prophet, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death is for Allah. If our life is for Allah, the research must be 
for Allah, which is part of our life, that make a huge difference in the way we conduct research and conceptualize what we do. Unfortunately, most of the researchers, they lose sight of such kind of adherence to such kind of conceptualization of the role of man. Man is honored, has free will, good by nature, and has good and bad inclinations. Hence, research has to be guided by Allah's commandment. Research is a form of seeking knowledge to have better life. Allah said, do not follow blindly what you do, what you don't know to be true. Ears, eyes, and heart will be questioned about all this. Generated knowledge has to be accurate, objective, as far as the researcher can. We cannot claim by any means like positivists that we can reach the whole truth. And the researcher will be accountable before Allah. And that is the spiritual dimension of our research. That is Iman. So we have to be careful from being a biased person. Allah grant man with mind to reason and was guided by revelation. Because man can get wrong. So it should be supported and guided by revelation. Hence, researcher has to exert his or her effort to seek truth with revelation guidance. So we cannot reach more likely objective knowledge unless we get the support and the integration of both the revealed and the acquired. Man has to use his or her mind to choose what is good and bad. What is his interest and public interest based on revelation? So even if you are looking at impact, what do we mean by impact? Looking for benefit, what kind of benefit? Looking for public interest, everybody is claiming this, this. But revelation will guide us and decide the standard of such kind of uh, public interest. Hence, the main aim is that knowledge so had to lead to recognize benefit by Allah as it is in the revelation. That's what should be recognized benefit. Man was created with good and bad inclination. If he or she left to follow only his or her desire, his or her ending will be bad because this life is a test. Researcher has to watch out the influence of his or her bad inclination and desire which are not acceptable by Allah. Man, if he or she exerted his her intellectual powers, it will reach and achieve part of the truth, but not the whole truth. Thus, generated knowledge by human beings are relative. The knowledge is relative. Mind might go astray if it is not supported by the introduction of, by the instruction of Allah. Revelation, Quran, Sunnah. But again, issues related to his personal and social life. It is more likely to go away and to go astray from the path of Allah, if you are seeking the knowledge from based on, uh, uh, about the personal social phenomena. More than, that's why we can see, more than 85% of the verses are focusing on guiding us about personal and social life. Whereas natural phenomena only mentioned in around 1,000 verses. Even those 1,000 verses has a relevance to our social and personal life. Hence, we have to seek guidance from revelation because it is more likely to go wrong when we study and investigate social and personal phenomena. Protecting the mind or intellect our intellectual war is, is fundamental goal in Islam. Hence, developing the mind through training and research is very important. So researchers have to be trained to develop their critical, creative 
and reasoning skill before embarking on research. Because by using the quality or the ability, reasoning ability is the only way to do research. Man is the Khalifa of Allah on earth and man has to act accordingly. Hence, research should lead to support the role of Khalifa on earth. Quran draws human beings' attention to utilize their intellectual power, thinking and reflection, tadabbur, in both revealed knowledge and investigated human and natural phenomena for the betterment of life and the well-being of insan. However, a systematic approach, and I have to stress on the word systematic, because positivists like Kerlinga, they don't believe except in causal uh, relationships, which lead to universal laws, even in social phenomena. But in Islam, I think we believe that in Islam, we can adopt several methodologies, not a methodology. For the betterment, as I said, of all being. However, a systematic approach was developed by Muslim investigators to investigate both revealed and acquired knowledge. And here, we have different methodologies to understand revelation, and we have different methodologies to understand natural and social phenomena. Muslim researchers have to be trained on the different systematic approaches or methods of research, which leads the, to the effective use of mind and heart and contribute to the well-being of people in both worlds. In Islam, research is not limited to natural and social phenomena. And again, I say, also, there are certain research methodologies to understand Hadith and Quran. The ability to learn and reason is what distinguish man from other creatures. So researchers have to utilize or realize that the research result they get is a grace from Allah. Because mind is the grace of Allah, which help us to be honored and dignified, then we have to be thankful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the product of mind we are using with his knowledge. Man was created to worship Allah in the comprehensive sense. Hence, conducting research and seeking knowledge is a form of worship. That will lead to intrinsic motivation to be more creative and exert more effort. Muslim researchers have intrinsic motivation. I have talked about that. The universe and all creatures were created by Allah and were made for the benefit of human beings. So, no expectation of conflict because the source of knowledge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we expect that investigating natural and social phenomena cannot, be, uh, can, cannot conflict with revealed knowledge. Now, what about life? This is some of the implication for the concept of man or human beings or insan. Life is created and man is commanded to construct and develop it so that human beings will have a good life here and the hereafter. Researchers have to work towards constructing life according to what Allah commanded us to do. Man was first sent by Allah to live on this planet for a certain period of time and go back to him. Researchers have to realize that their research have to help people to succeed in this life and the life to come. Researchers have to integrate revelation to what we learn by doing and conducting research. Allah created man to test him, to worship him, to develop life and improve the well-being of human beings. All creatures, living and non-living, of Allah have a purpose. Nothing was created in vain. And Allah said, researchers, have to contribute toward achieving ultimate and higher goals. Life is run according to Allah's sunnah or laws or principles, sunan. Be natural or social. That might be confused by Muslim researchers, however, because those who are talking about laws only positivists, because 
interpreted philosophy, they do not believe in it. However, in Muslim paradigm, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all phenomena, all creatures, according to his sunan, to his laws and principles. However, Allah provided us with the most important knowledge to which we cannot arrive at by ourselves alone. Hence, Allah grant us with the faculty to seek knowledge and generate it in a systematic, in systematic method and guiding principle from Quran and Sunnah to help us to lead ourselves and other to good life in dunya and akhira. Researchers should focus in their research on what they can do and just depend on revelation in matters which they cannot comprehend. Because our thinking, our mind cannot comprehend unseen. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it taken for granted. We have to take for granted whether related to the belief system or ethics or worship. The key concept in this life for Muslims are takreem. We are honored, dignified, creation of humans in the best manner. Istiklaf, ibadah, worship, tashkheer. That is, Allah has created everything for the benefit of human being. That's what we have to do in our research. I'mar, we have also to aim at constructing both lives, ikhtibar, testing, and we have to produce knowledge which help us to straighten our life in this test. Researchers have to cultivate this concept in the research input process and output. Allah is the source of knowledge. Now we are talking about knowledge. First, Allah is the source of knowledge and he is all knowing. So there is a unity of science in terms of its sources. In Islam, whereas the unity of science, for instance, in positivism, it is in terms of methodology, not the sources. And interpretive society, uh, 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 sorry, uh, paradigm, they don't believe in single reality, but in multiple realities. In Islam, the mind senses are working in an integrated way to understand reality within the framework of revealed knowledge. Allah said, do not follow blindly what you do not know to be true. As we stated earlier, it indicates that we know through using our hearing, seeing things, and being a thinking and being conscious of Allah that we will be accountable before him. And this is the, as I said, the iman dimension in our research. Heart, senses, and iman are important to know reality and get knowledge. Muslim researchers have to ensure the objectivity in their research as far as they can. They have to be conscious of Allah in their work and be ready to be accountable before him in everything they have done in their research in the hereafter. Allah said in Surah An-Nahl, it is Allah who brought you out of your mother's womb knowing nothing and gave you hearing and sight and mind so that you might be thankful. And that's the aim of research is being thankful. It is not only to reach as, as knowledge as an end on its own, but it leads to the seeking of pleasure and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is part and parcel of our research um, investigation. Researchers have to remember Allah and be thankful of him by abiding to Allah's commandment. We human beings try our best to request to quest for truth through reason and sense experience. However, we attempt to discover, discover truth by both reason and sense experience but we cannot claim it is the objective truth simply because of human beings' mind and senses are limited. Researchers have to admit their weaknesses and limitations. This should lead to humility and humbleness, which is part of the researcher's ethics. Man has his own weaknesses. He cannot understand, comprehend objectively by using his mind and senses alone. Knowledge is necessary for life. Human beings are in need for it to know Allah, thank him and, work, and worship him. They need it also to understand and discover the sunan or the laws of Allah, which govern natural and social phenomena. This use lead to understanding the sunan 
and construct life, in, uh, which is the impact of our knowledge we have to adopt and the well-being of insan and the success in the hereafter. Both natural and social knowledge reflect the unity of science in terms of their source. All of them come from Allah. So social and natural knowledge are in harmony and consistence, uh, consistency with uh, revelation. Truth is external. We believe as Muslim and people understanding might be perceived differently. That's the difference between us and other paradigms. We might have different conceptualization of knowledge, although we are looking at the same object or the same event. Knowledge help us to lead a better life. So unless we get a better life, their research and knowledge is meaningless. Knowledge cannot be completely value free. And this is part and parcel of Islamic research methodology because the researcher cannot control bias 100%. Hundred, even if he or she try their best to control their emotion and value. Hence, human knowledge is relative. Integrated, revealed, and human knowledge is the best way to increase research findings, validity, and objectivity. Furthermore, accepting revelation as the reference to our human research, then we take for granting to base our research on a set of beliefs and values which come from Allah. Western secular philosophy referred to man as God who decide his or her man-made belief system and values, both positivist or quantitative and qualitative paradigm. They believe us so. Muslim researchers attempt to conduct research to achieve what Allah commanded him or her to do in this life. Despite reality is external, but human might, uh, humans might process it differently, as we said. Knowledge in Islam is not an end by itself, but it should lead to Iman and good life. Hearing, focusing on understanding through the use of language and symbols, whereas seeing or vision get knowledge directly by observing real objective. Mind then is superior to both senses where it analyzes and conceptualizes information to become abstract. Then man reflects and translates the acquired knowledge to human benefit. Researchers have to realize that research does not end at arriving at understanding and formulating laws and theories, but to have impact in life. Research is a form of seeking knowledge, which is must for all Muslims, males and females. Different conception of what is man, reality, and knowledge lead to different research methodologies. Research in Islam is a kind of exerting effort or she had by scholars to generate knowledge by following a systematic approach. Maqasid are very helpful in constructing research in many ways, such as in deciding priorities of research, because we have five areas of priority, and that research methodologies are always subjected to development. Even research methodology we can develop as we go along, like what the Muslims are doing in Usul al -Fak. We call all Muslim scholars to contribute in developing research methodologies and train our Muslim researchers on what we develop. Research in Islam is based on the conceptualization of Muslim personality, Muslim society. That is very important, I think, because unless we know what type of people we want to develop and educate, what type of society we have to develop, then we cannot do research. We have to start conceptualizing the Muslim personality, the Muslim society. Then we focus on research, which give priority to uh, work on those lines. There are several research methodologies developed by Muslim scholars across history. And Muslim at the beginning, they focused first on understanding revealed knowledge for their importance. So they started developing the methodologies for understanding of Quran and Sunnah. And we all know that um, Muslim developed usul al-fiqh for knowing the rulings and um, uh, according to context. And we know that Muslims um, developed mustalah al-hadith as a methodology and usul al-tafsir as a methodology of understanding the Quran. So that's again, different mythologies for different contexts and um, content. 
different methodology could be adopted to know and discover the Sunan of Allah. So for instance, we can discover the Sunan or the laws of the principle of Allah in social phenomena if we refer to Quran Sunnah because there are a lot of implications of Sunan in the Quran Sunnah and there are lots of books written about the Sunan of Allah, the social Sunan um, and the personal or the self Sunan in the Quran and the Sunnah. Both quantitative and qualitative research methodology have taken extreme positions in looking at man, reality, life, and knowledge. The first would argue for objectivity, single reality, strict experimental methodology, generalization, while the second would argue for multiple realities, subjectivity, and only interpretive methodology. The mainstream research methodology today are scientific, what they call, they term, say, uh, scientific methodology or positivism and interpretive methodology, like phenomenology. Both of them have taken extreme conception of research methodology, despite the fact that there is a new call for mixed methods today, but without changing the basic assumptions about man, reality, life, and knowledge. So their understanding is not that different at the end of the day, because the assumption more or less different, but regarding man, reality, life, and knowledge, so they are not accumulative. They are always fighting and conflicting each other, and they develop different theories. Until now, but they could not arrive at any universal law. Muslims have given priority in developing research methodologies, as I said. Later, Muslim scholars developed, for instance, after studying the Quran Sunnah, experimental method very early. And the Western scholars adopted this experimental method. However, the Muslim did not find conflict between revealed knowledge and the study of natural phenomena by experimental method. Whereas in the West, because the church is a man-made religion. So most of the verse in the Quran, as I said, it focuses on social side of our life and personal side of our life. We have to go and study it as such because our mind cannot reach objectively regarding certain areas and we have to adhere to what is revealed and take it for granted. In the Muslim history, there was no conflict, as I said, between the methodologies they adopted. And nowadays, we started hearing even among Muslims that there is a problem. So what the Western face, we don't face. Recent call now is to adopt mixed methodology, but I said it is not the right because the assumptions are different. Now, social phenomena again and life, we should start in our Muslim research, we should start with what concern people in life and in the hereafter. We have to be concerned about real life problems, not only problem which has no relevance to our life. That's why we have to adopt in Islam, I think, we tend to prefer integrated approach, integrated research, interdisciplinary research, so that we can integrate both acquired knowledge of different disciplines and reveal knowledge to understand more objectively the social phenomena. Also topics of research priority in Islam are also different. Western philosophy focuses more on materialistic life. Whereas in Maqasid, we have five areas. We have to know what our life is holistic and integrated in nature. So we have to adopt such kind of methodologies. The most important criterion Muslim research must be directly or indirectly has to lead to benefits. Every research should start from needs, sunan or laws which are universal 
only can come for the revelation of Quran because context change and the interest of people change as many scholars, Muslim scholars stated. So we can find likelihood of Sunan or laws specific to particular time and context. Both induction and deduction in investigating social media could be used and there is no need to dwell on that. And this is some of the um, Sunan which is uh, mentioned in the Quran. Here I would like just to mention um, we have to go down to the grassroots level where we talk about um, tools. And I'm going to talk about the interview here. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have to ask the expert. Uh, that's very important in interviewing people. Should we take random sample or selected sample? To me, we have to think about who knows about what we are investigating. So, so that we can select the expert in the interview, but particularly in the interview I'm talking about now. Just an example, how Islamic paradigm can influence even our tools. Also from Hadith, I am adopting the concept of Tawatur, a group of people replicate the same findings, the same text. So we can say the more or the bigger the sample, the more likely the knowledge will be acceptable, although it is still uh, uh, relative. Also, I'm quoting another concept called Ijma. So if there is any particular phenomena and the researcher in one particular area or country, they have reached to the same conclusion, either by investigating it or by approving it, that is, we can establish establishes as acquired knowledge, still relative, but we have to continue investigating it, either to confirm it or to refute it. And also, in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have to prove that what other people are, when they are talking to us, they are accurate. So you have to ensure accuracy. Also, in one hadith, the Prophet sallam said, A person, if, they, if, they, if a group of people came to him to dispute, he must judge, judge for the one who have a better argument, logical argument, and he might tell lies. So it means that even the prophet could not assure that what he's listening to could be completely objective. So we have to make sure it is accurate. I think the time is very limited and I have gone only half of my slides. Allah. Hope to meet you some other time. I should stop at this uh, moment and maybe listen to your uh, comment and uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Daoud, for your elaborate presentation. Very interesting. Many new things have been uh, uh, explored and uh, your discussion is definitely useful to our students because majority of our uh, participants today are the postgraduate students from different uh, faculties and in particular from the Department of Historical and Comparative Religion. But unfortunately, uh, the time of Salah is approaching. Otherwise, uh, we would give you more time to uh, go for the second round. So with this, I thank you very yeah. much for your elaborate presentation. And let me now uh, go to our third speaker, uh, who is none other than Associate Professor Dr. Amna Bahari, who is currently teaching at the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion, who have Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences, IIUM, which is now known as Ahmed Ibrahim, Ahmed, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, Kulia of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. 
From today onwards, we will call this kulia as Abdul Hamid, Abu Sulaiman, Kulia of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. Thanks to our IIM authorities for naming this kulia. Dr. Amna has graduated from Kulia of Economics and Management, IIM, and continued her postgraduate studies in Islamic studies, focusing on the Hadith methodology at IIUM and later at ISTAG. Her interest areas are in Hadith studies and their methods, Islamic ethics, Islamic thought, contemporary moral issues, and spirituality. She has written books like Ta'awil, Mukhtalif al Hadith, and Annotated Translation. Sharing her thoughts with her authors, she has contributed to the writing of Prophet Yaqub, Parenting Style, IAUM Sayyid, IAUM Sajatra, Profiling, Spiritual Therapy, and Islamic Perspective, and the Manual of Spiritual Therapy. She also has published several articles, and the recent, and the most recent one, and the most relevant, which is very timely, is Work Life Faith Balance The Relevance in Verse 77 of Surah Al Qasas in the context of COVID 19. In the context of COVID 19, with this brief uh, introduction, may I respectfully call upon my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Amna Bahari, to present her thoughts on research methodology from the Islamic perspective. You okay, right. thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Prof. Tamim. Um, to other two presenters, Prof. Dawood, you have explained. I wish I can hear more <laughs> instead of me explaining it. How long do I have it uh, now, Prof? Because now it's about uh, Maghrib and then after yeah. that? No, we will try to finish before Maghrib. Once we disperse, it's difficult to get the audience. Uh, try your best line, inshallah. We Maybe have two more minutes, Prof, to uh, perform our uh, Can we finish by 7.10? Because we can still pray at 7.10 Maghrib. Okay, no problem. I, 10 minutes will do, yeah? Okay. I'll skip uh, part of my presentation. It's quite uh, just like Prof. Hidabi. I have some uh, quite lengthy discussion, uh, a few few slides. But anyway, I, I will skip some which is not necessary because it has been re repeated by other two scholars, um, uh, Prof. Hidabi and also our our learned uh, Mufti. Uh, I mean, they have already, he has already uh, explained on it. Yeah. So, okay, I'll share you with uh, what I have right now briefly. Yes, everybody can look at it now. Yes? Yes, we can see. Okay, I'll go to the first one. What I'm going to uh, explain is actually on this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Uh, briefly, this is actually uh, discussing on the uh, research in Islamic studies. What I intend to discuss is on this. Uh, what is research, I will skip because it already been mentioned and so also briefly on Quranic view on research and I would like to focus more on current status of research methodology and research gap because these are the questions which students are asking, Madam, uh, what are the topics that I should be concentrating? Can you suggest? Oh my God, I say, uh, this is why I'm focusing on this, yeah? research gaps. So uh, as I have said earlier on, uh, I will not be touching on this. Uh, you have done already. Now, the purpose of research as, as uh, we mentioned earlier is actually uh, yeah, through application, uh, application of my, my, my internet is stable, eh, bro? and then to face challenge, to solve problem, to get intellectual joy, to serve uh, society, eh? because uh, our, our objective is, as I said, as, as Prof also mentioned earlier, is to please Allah Ta'ala. All right. Um, now, the Quran also have encourages all of us to search uh, and in that uh, uh, investigation. Among others, you can see here, these are some examples. In fact, there are so many, numerous, which is very interesting, requesting all of us to travel. Yeah? Uh, these are the brief examples that I have quoted here, but I'm not going to explain every single uh, versus here. But the important one that can be extracted here is this one. Um, asking us, particularly from Surah Al Imran, there you are, it's already Azan. Uh, similar situation came to pass before you, so travel through and see the fear of deniers. And what next? Indeed, the in the creation of the heaven and earth, and the day and the night, there are signs for people of reason. So this is where we, we could. Uh, see the, the 
the 10 uh, asking the 10 uh, citation of the Quranic verses that focus or instigate or it pushes us to understand uh, research and to, to do research. So also this one, the same. Okay, I move on. I will not be reading as I said to all of you. It's quite a uh, long time. It's already almost not with us. Right. Uh, uh, this one is also interesting. Uh, from Surah Rum, uh, have they never traveled? You see, repeatedly, yeah, about the earth and seen what they, uh, the outcome of those before them who obstinately uh, disobey our sign. Okay, I'll move on. Yes, so what is the, the, the point that I want to highlight here from what we have said? Yeah, the first one is that the Quran uses repetition. Yeah? Prof also mentioned just now thousands of verses, repetition to encourage certain key concepts in the consciousness of the listeners. So what is it? Uh, Allah. Imagine you can, it has been mentioned 2,800 times. And then uh, Rob, sustainer, 950 times. Island, 750 mentions. So imagine that. Eh? So uh, hadith also, will not, I will not be focusing, it's quite lengthy. But what I want to share here, the most important one, hadith is the one. There is no envy. There is no envy except a, to a person whom Allah has given wealth and his spend right way, and a person whom Allah has given wisdom, and he gave his decision and teaches it to the other. So, uh, meaning to say through research methodology, not only that we understand uh, the subject matters and relate it to the, the, the benefit for the ummah. Yeah? Uh, then you can check it from Sahih Bukhari. Uh, this is I have taken from sunnah.com. Yeah? All right. Uh, again, uh, when we look through the Quranic verses and also the hadith, these are the point that uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad salam commanded knowledge upon all Muslims and urged them to seek knowledge as far as they could reach and also to seek it at all time. So uh, I move on. Uh, current status. This is important. Yeah? So what is actually that is happening today? You can see the emergence of Islamic research has been a phenomenon in, in, research, in recent years. Uh, because uh, you can see uh, the studies is, is actually asking all of us to look from Islamic viewpoint. Okay? Though Prof. Uh, Hidabi has explained a lengthy uh, talking about positivists, they are, uh, how they talk about the importance of uh, material, but then how Islam look at it. Yeah? So let's see. Some scholars maintain that uh, uh, consequences of the uh, why this uh, such as uh, According to them, uh, looking from Islamic researchers, is what attributed to Iranic uh, Revolution yeah, and then the bombing and then the Arab Spring. Now, this is mentioned by few scholars like what, like this uh, uh, Saleh, and also uh, most of the study on Islam, include the Islamic study, employ the current research methodologies. Yeah, and Prof said it is not use is not uh, uh, correct because why the the tasawur, I mean, the worldview is not the same. However, you see another viewpoint which is quite interesting, uh, the current status by al -Buti. So is, is the current conventional research approach appropriate for Islamic-based research or studies in the field of Islamic studies? So this is what al -Buti, Allah Yarham, for decades said that Muslim intellectual in their golden period of Islam devised the scientific approaches. No doubt. Eh? Prof has mentioned just now all this mustalah al-hadith, al-mutafsil, all of that. Al-rijal, eh? jarah wa ta'adil, all that. Yeah? It's, it's very scientific. So it should, however, it should, however, be simplified. This is Al-Buti's idea. Eh? So that it can be used again today. Meaning how relevant are the uh, method used by scholars of the past in today's context. So that is why some scholars yeah, said text, context. That's the relevantization, the, the, the most beloved terms by Prof. Tamir Usama. Okay, uh, now Islamic sciences are there, uh, which is what uh, have been mentioned. For example, here, uh, Al Buti mentioned these are all the methods. Yeah? Uh, how do we derive hukum, how we derive fatwa, which is very, very important. And how is it relevant into this context now, particularly this issue of COVID-19? Ya Allah, so many, it is opening a big avenue for all of us to work out. But little has been used at, through looking from this perspective in context of, in context of COVID-19. Okay, I move on. Um, 
So Ibn Khaldun also said that uh, Shafi'i has already uh, formulated the, the science of Usul Fiqh in his Risalah. Uh, then, and then, uh, okay, this is, had been mentioned earlier. Now, so uh, this is more interesting because some claim that there is no such thing as scientific finding. So there you go, um, which I have cited from uh, two scholars, two writers eh, in, in an article. What are the, the point that they want to say is that uh, Ibn Haytham, yeah, a scientific research philosophy uh, based on uh, five strong points. What is it? What is it? The first one, epistemology. And then the second, Pasawur, is based on Tawheed. The third is on holistic aspect. And then fourth, ontology. Yeah? So these are all the terms, the psych uh, philosophical underpinning in, in Islamic uh, scientific research. Yeah? So this is what I have found. Okay, having said that, again, this is the face of our great Ibn Haytham, which we were talking about. Now, having said that, uh, what is actually this research gap? Uh, research gap briefly, <clears throat> because uh, uh, students are asking, what is this all about? It's actually missing information. Fill the gap. And now, as I said just now, uh, with the uh, with the COVID nineteen, the pandemic, it opens wide for all of us to 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 study and and to make research related and make it make the, the, the our study re relevant. And how do you uh, make it relevant? By referring to the text of the Quran or the Hadith. So uh, my, this is my references. I'm going to take another uh, 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 my, of mine. So this one I have shown in my class, but this is actually relevant as well. Um, yes. What is actually a research gap? Here, the definition is that it's a question or a problem uh, that has not been answered by any of the existing studies or research within our field. As I said just now, quite a number of hadith or the uh, Quranic verses in related to, to COVID-19 has not been uh, worked on. Yeah? Sometimes we find a research gap if all the existing research is outdated and is in need of new updated research. Uh, so for example, in the studies of internet in 2000, for example, is far, far advanced today what more with this COVID-19 what, what more with this MCO thingy that people are talking about or circuit breaker in in Singapore yes a research gap is an area of study that is under research or currently unexplored which allows us to contribute original research to our field uh, so this is where our contrib contribution remember that what we are going to write is actually to benefit of the OMA yeah? So, all right, I move on a little bit. A very brief one, start with a to broad topic related to our field of interest. Then number two, uh, conduct preliminary topic. Begin with a simple line online, tafsir, for example. No, <laughs> Wikipedia, we can read, but we will not be referring in our write-up in our knee. But then it's okay to narrow our topic as we learn about it. However, keep our, our option open until we are sure we have found an area with gaps in research. Number three. Uh, so I go on. Okay, why am I bringing all this succulent element? Because it's actually what needs to be done to, to get this uh, research, uh, research gap is that we need to compile a wide range of articles about our in topic in, in, in of our interest. So these are among the points. Yeah, and then... Uh, that's it, yeah, finding a gap. So now I'm giving you some example which uh, students uh, were, were asking, Madam, can you share? Yeah, this is how, what I'm sharing. Yeah? So this is for my little, my for undergraduate class, which I, I have put it here, referring to uh, Al-Ghazali's idea of tawakkul as of his minhaj, Al-Abidin, and its relevance to, this is the term that nowadays, yeah, uh, stay safe. Yeah, kita jaga kita, which is Malay. How do you go about? And I provide for them uh, research questions so that they are able to. Uh, they have done. Yeah, this is a form of exercise, but I corrected them. Uh, this is actually the right way of doing it. Yeah? And then uh, some also sample on taqwa, and then khawwaraja, roja, yeah? and then pride, and then also doubt and suspicion. Uh, prof, I'm sorry, I'm taking a few more minutes here. Yeah? Tough wits, and then gratitude. 
and then patient. This is very interesting, particularly Al Ghazali's view on patient in his minhaj and its relevancy to cope with losing our father to COVID-19. These are the most uh, crucial topic among our students who, lo who lost their parents, not only father, but both par I mean, mother and father. How do they cope? So is there a point that, that Al Ghazali, as of his minhaj al-abidin, uh, brought forward for all of us to ponder, for all of us to think, and how do we practice it? So this is where, and uh, it is re related to COVID-19. So this is some point, Ria, jealousy, and others. So these are the sample prof just to share. I will stop here. It's already 7.10. So sorry in, in hurry, but uh, forgive me if it's, there is any you know, uh, uncertainty or whatever. Pre prof, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Associate Professor Dr. Amna Bahari. First of all, let me apologize for what has happened unfortunately for today when we planned this uh, webinar the maghrib time was uh, at 7:30 and we moved from 5 to 5:30 because there were requests from students uh, willing to follow our program from different countries uh, of course there are our students some of them uh, would like to follow from Nigeria, from Kenya, from Egypt, from Kazakhstan, from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, and from uh, Kenya. I can see Abdi Nouri sitting from Kenya, and many others are from different countries. So they wanted this time so that they would be able to follow. So unfortunately, their time was comfortable for them, and our time is not comfortable because the Maghrib time was supposed to be at 7.30 two months ago when we planned. Now it is 7 o'clock. So I, we missed actually the, the, the most important uh, points uh, from all the three presenters. Prof. Dawood uh, had to finish uh, uh, only uh, with halfway and Dr. Amna also had to finish in halfway. Probably we may plan for another half a day webinar uh, focusing more on mm -hmm. different dimensions of recent methodology from Islamic perspective, inshallah. So I apologize for what has happened to me as the organizer. So with this, let me take let me take this opportunity to first of all thank. Uh, can uh, I suggest something, doctor? Yes, yes, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. And first of all, there is nothing to apology because uh, it is a slogan for unity that uh, we have a. Uh, uh, global village and we are representing different uh, uh, geographical locations so you are managing the whole world in a your okay. webinar so this is the miracle and that's happened in international conferences so nothing to worry secondly uh, i think this webinar has created an impact that a thirst for research in islamic studies has been created what we can do, it's my humble suggestion, then we can launch a three or two days workshop or uh, a short course or an online course with the help of these scholars that uh, what they have in their slides and uh, after their suggestion, like I see that in uh, slides of the Dr. Amna, there were uh, different scholars were cited. So we can launch an online course also. This is my humble suggestion. Inshallah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhammad Wasi, uh, for your uh, valuable uh, suggestion. Inshallah, I will discuss with my uh, seminar committee of the department, and then I will uh, come back to the three learned uh, scholars who have uh, made their presentations today. If all of us agree, we may go for a half a day workshop, uh, depending upon uh, depending on the convenience of Prof. Daud, Prof. Uh, 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 Dr. Mufti and also Dr. Amna Bahari, maybe we can plan. And in this way, it will be more useful. I can see from the chat, many of our students participating from different parts of the world are requesting for the slides to be shared. If you have no objection, please forward your slides and we will uh, uh, upload in our uh, website and they will be inshallah benefiting. And a day will come maybe in a couple of months we will organize a workshop 
uh, a more comprehensive workshop as suggested by Mufti, and that will be inshallah beneficial to the uh, students of our uh, Islamic uh, uh, reveal knowledge and heritage. So with this, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Mufti, Prof. Dawood, and Dr. Amna Bahari, and the entire team, uh, the technical team, the student uh, technical team, uh, and others from the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion. And also I thank uh, Prof. Dawood for uh, uh, collaborating with us officially in the seminar. And the same goes to uh, Mufti, who is the editor of Hamdad Islamicus, which is indexed in Scopus. I'm sure from today onwards, Mufti will be receiving more articles from our students who would like to publish their articles in journal, which is indexed in Scopus, which is a priority in our IOEM. Inshallah, uh, Dr. Mufti will be more kind enough to accommodate uh, the articles from our students as well as All staff. are most welcome. Inshallah. All are most welcome. So thank you, Dr. Mufti, inshallah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you don't have to sacrifice the quality. I'm sure, as I mentioned in my introductory remark, that our students are competent enough our students are uh, capable of writing uh, very good quality uh, academic articles using the primary sources because we use bilingual uh, medium of instruction in our uh, faculty and also in the university. Our students are capable of referring to the Arabic uh, fundamental sources. They will be, inshallah, providing very good articles to be published in Hamdad Islamicus. And I uh, thank all those who have participated in this webinar, particularly the young scholars, the students of the postgraduate uh, degree programs from different universities and also from other countries. With this, let me uh, thank all of you uh, once again, and we are uh, uh, going to pray Maghrib. And because of this, we could not entertain questions probably uh, from different sources, from YouTube and also from Zoom. And as I mentioned, we will try to think of a workshop uh, in two months time from now. And meanwhile, we will share your slides to our students. And with this, thank you all very much. Uh, once again, uh, may Allah bless you all. May Allah protect us. May Allah help the entire humanity with his blessings. Wa billahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So thank you very much, Prof. Dawood. Thank, thank you, you thank uh, you. Dr. Wasi. Thank you, Dr. Amna. And thank you all my students, Ashes and everybody. I can see my students from Kenya sitting, Kazakhstan sitting. For, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. How are you? Fine, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Barakallah, fake, Prof. There we need the slides, sir. Dr. Yes, Tamim yes. Usama, sir, we need the slides, please. Inshallah, we will share with you. Inshallah, we will share with you. Sure, sure. And yes, yes, we will attend, attend I, the I, next I have program. The slides. Of, I have the recorded statements of uh, uh, Mufti with me, and I will take it from Prof. Dawood and Dr. Amna. With that uh, present uh, in permission, we will share with you, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakum We have to rush, otherwise, it will be Allah, then we are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.